everyone. Thank you for joining uh, Wenqian and I today. So today with me is uh, a good friend, Wenqian from Anhui Agricultural University. Uh, he actually, she actually has an English name. She goes by Amber. And Wenqian uh, uh, has a master degree in tea studies. And uh, since she graduated in 2012, she uh, basically uh, has become a lecturer for uh, tea culture and history for the university. Uh, she's a beloved teacher by undergrad students. Um, so I'm very, very excited to have her with us today. Uh, Wenqian, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, thank you, Shuna. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. I'm very, well, uh, very glad to be here, and thank you for all the invitation. And I am, um, hi, uh, I'm Amber. Uh, just call me Amber, it's okay. I'm Jiang Wenqian, a lecturer from Anhui Agriculture University, uh, from the tea sc School of Tea and Food Technology. Um, I majored in tea science as a very um, hardcore science way, but I just you know, give a way to the tea culture, which uh, where I find my real passion in. So I study for my master's degree as the tea his history and cultural phenomena of tea the study uh, for three years. And so uh, I've been learning from about tea, anything about tea for 15 years. So I guess it's quite a long time for me to uh, build up something to share with everyone only as a very new printer for the you know, tea all learning and uh, tea and also uh, so, someone who knows something little about Chinese people drinking tea in every style we had and we still having now. <laughs> so oh, thank you for sharing that. All right. Um, so we have a uh, great material for everyone today. Uh, shall we start the PowerPoint? Yes, of course. Let me start it. And then this is all kind of like flashing back my uh, previous weeks for t for online teaching for my students, undergraduate students. Very, very uh, frustrating and also very interesting to do so. So here's, uh, we all can see on my PPT about introducing how the Chinese people drink tea in the past. And t today, this episode, we focus on the first two chapters uh, plus uh, with uh, chapter zero uh, before the Song Dynasty, uh, before Ming Dynasty, uh, Song Dynasty, Tang Dynasty major uh, focused on. And this is my, uh, my name, Amber, just anyhow. And, and, and I work for the Anhui Agriculture University where I actually graduated from. So I'm very familiar with everything that my school taught me about the Chinese people way of drinking tea. So before I jump to the time, but before I jump, jump to the uh, lecture, uh, I want to introduce you guys to some basic history lessons about the time. So firstly, we, today we focus on the Tang Dynasty and Song Dynasty, two actually very long time of period, long, very long time for history to see. You can see the Tang Dynasty in Chinese history which is not the longest one yet, not the longest <laughs> dynasty yet. Still, it lasts for almost 300 years. And it starts from the six, six, uh, 618 to 907. It's a very long time period. And then to the Song Dynasty. So we can see today we will uh, travel through the history uh, back to the very old um, prehistory era to the Song Dynasty, to the 13th, late 13th. Uh, century of the uh, time. So if you guys don't really know, um, uh, we can, you can, I think we should ha probably share my PPT or slideshow some uh, later methods or something to figure out what time is exactly. So yeah. let's so, start from the chapter zero before the town density, which is also a very long <laughs> story already. Um, yeah. Some people um, actually, uh, we where we were, were educated as the China, we, Chinese civilization, we have over 5,000 years long. And um, some people believe that only 3,000 years uh, can be certified or um, can be proved by the archaeological proofs and the other proofs. Um, but today, we're not going to argue about all the timeline. But before Tang Dynasty, we do have so many evidence about tea drinking. Maybe not as magical or mythical as we think it was. It will used to be, but still, we have a very long time drinking tea history for over two thousand years. That starts from using tea as 
a food source. That is a very, um, probably very uh, cold knowledge or some very, uh, very rare knowledge for most people because we drinking tea every day. Uh, maybe not for me because I just have my coffee. <laughs> but still for most of Chinese people. And yeah, I love to start my day yeah. as well. Yeah. That we were made, um, my, myself is basically made of caffeine. So I like everything with caffeine, including caffeine and also tea. And uh, probably for some people in China, southern parts of China and the people from the UK, from other countries who are very into tea, we always taking tea as a beverage that we steep into the water and drinking the water uh, infusion every, and everything. But let's, detect, uh, let's uh, take the timeline back to the very, very long time ago, like 3,000 years ago. What would people care about the most? But then, of course, it's the food. So the tea actually was found as a um, in in very, very uh, it's, it's, it's found, it was found as a food source that will not kill people. That cannot kill people because people ingest it and feel like, oh, it's okay, it's very bitter, it's astringent, but it's still edible. So before prehistory era, um, yeah, that, that was um, found mostly um, inherited by some of the Han people, ethnic groups of Han people, and some ethnic groups of uh, like minority groups in China, like Lahu uh, people and or the um, Tuja people. They use the tea as food ingredients, uh, comp combined with other ingredients that to make like Paka Lei Cha, like a Ke Jia Lei Cha in Chinese, which is basically using tea as an ingredient, a crucial ingredient to make the porridge and soup taste very well. But this, this still can be only known as a um, logical deduction. This is not proved yet. Um, and uh, before, uh, besides be uh, assumed as a food resource, uh, sorry, as a food resource, um, there are several documents actually proved that uh, with like the, uh, the first encyclopedia book of Arya, like in, in whole Ch Chinese history, which was written about 2,300 uh, years about, about before now, and noted by uh, scholars like Guo Pu in the Jin Dynasty in the third century to fourth century, and uh, other scholars after him. So in Guo Pu's note that he said, this, tea, this tree uh, is called Jia by then, not the Tu or Cha name, Jia, the character Jia, which is a small evergreen bush. Leaves can be made into porridges. So this is very hardcore evidence that being passed down by Chinese people for generations and generations that notice that tea uh, can be used as a food resource already by then. It's a very long time ago. And uh, in this way is also um, can, um, maintained by or inherited by different uh, people like in China, uh, different ethnic groups, different minorities. As we can see now in the picture, this is the Wa Zhu people, like Wa people, uh, living in the southern, uh, west thousand Yunnan province in China now. And, uh, and the second one that a lot of Chinese people will believe very, very hard, <laughs> deadly into that the tea was found as a medicine, which is um, maybe not very logical, but still it, it cannot be proved to be wrong. Uh, there are so many myths about the person who found the tea. Uh, Chinese people um, take Shen Nongshi, who is actually a leader, probably a leader or a, a gather up a character for the tribe who found the, uh, lots of the material uh, plant uh, resources like tea and uh, like rice and uh, uh, pepper, Chinese pepper or some other uh, plant resources in China, then all this credit has been given to one mythical figure called Shen Nongshi, which was, uh, who is written by the uh, Sima Qian, the very, first, uh, very, very famous um, historian in Han Dynasty, 2000 years ago. He said he is, uh, Shen Nongshi is one of the very famous three emperors pre-Chinese history. But yeah. that is only some kind of imagination and some kind of um, things that people, Chinese people in our history would like to do to giving all the credit to uh, some very uh, big power people. But um, now we know there's no archeological 
proves that for Shen Nong Shi Hu as a person ever lived in the, in the China's land, but still it didn't really matter for the people who, who lives in back to Tang Dynasty like 1,000 years ago, 15 centuries ago, to believe that Shen Nong is actually a person who lived on the earth once, and they built a temple for him, actually temples. As far as I know, there are three Shen Nong Shi or Yan Di Si, three Shen Nong temple uh, in China. One located in my uh, hometown, Shanxi province, and where we also have Huang Di. So that's basically where the believe as the Chinese Chinese civilization start up with. And uh, for Shen Nong, who, yeah. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit background on uh, Shen Nong Shi. So, um, so, so, so we mentioned that, you know, uh, in Sima Qian's Shi, Shi Ji, we talk about the, yeah, the, the San Huang Wu Di, right? The three Huang and the five Di. And I think um, oftentimes when I uh, here in the West, when people put together narratives about T's origin, uh, similar to Chinese people, is often credit to Shen Nong, which can be translated to divine farmer. However, uh, just know that he's not an emperor. This is a very major understanding. As you can see from the picture, um, he's depicted often to have uh, two antlers, right? Um, and also, he uh, usually is in the animal hide. He's literally a caveman. Um, this, I think this misunderstanding really has to do with the word emperor was actually borrowed uh, to pay tribute to all these mythical ancestors. So basically when we talk about Shen Nong as the emperor in that time period, the word emperor did not mean emperor. It was much, much later, right, in... Um, <laughs> Right, by uh, Qin Shi Huang, right, the, 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 the emperor who has the, you know, whose tomb uh, was found with all the Terragoda warriors, which is also uh, Wen Xian's hometown. So, um, yeah, so, <laughs> basically, so, so it's only then uh, they decided to uh, come up with a word that represents what emperor really means, and they decided to combine the collective title of all these mythical, uh, mythical ancestors and call them emperor. So this is very important because I also hear bizarre stories of people mm. come together of how uh, Shen Nong would travel with his like wife and kid hiking the mountain. I was like, no, he didn't have a wife and kid. You know, he's like caveman. Um, and then, or he was like sitting in his backyard boiling water and kettle. It's very arguable if there was ever kettle in that time. Yeah. This was a period where uh, Chinese believed that people you know, basically eat raw meat. Um, and so, so, and, and, and wear animal hide. And also, um, uh, another thing would be like, he had a, like a crystal belly and he saw a tea leaf circling in his belly and he thought that was examining his body and the word examination in Chinese is, uh, one of the word is chai, and that's why we call it chai. Well, first of all, as we you know, kind of learned from Wen Qian already, uh, tea was not called tea until uh, in Tang Dynasty. Oh, sorry, sorry, tea was not called cha until in Tang Dynasty. Prior to that, it can be called jia, called shi, right? It can be called tu, but it was not cha. So the word, so yeah. basically there's a lot of misalignment if you um, do a very basic examination with, with actual Chinese history. So I just wanted to give a little background info on that because I think it's kind of important when we talk about the uh, the origin story of, uh, you know, of tea, even though it's a, it's a myth, but um, I often say, you know, it's like the Genesis story in the Bible, um, even though, you know, whoever talks about it might be arguable if it happened or not, but still there's a version of that that we're kind of all familiar with. You can't just like mix up uh, even the story. Let's to say even if it is a story. So that, that was my point. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Let's, uh, let's get, now get back to the Shen Nong's uh, discovery. Uh, one of the most spread uh, legend uh, or myth about Shen Nong who found in the tea, the way that he was, uh, he has a, um, how say this crystal belly, a very, you know, uh, mythical way of living in a world, a crystal belly that can be observed or how, how uh, the food and the, the plant that he take in. So for uh, as him, as, as a Shen Nong, as a very great divine farmer, he tried every plant. And um, people believe that one day that Shen Nong met to the uh, tons of the poison things. 
and he was almost died. And uh, he just when just when then he let out under the tree, uh, which the, the dripping the dew from the tea leaf, from the tree leaves and dro dropped into his mouth and saved him. And that tree is tea. Every almost every tea lover in China learned or heard about the legends. Some believe, some do not, because from date back to all the old uh, documentaries in tea in Chajing, like the classic tea written in the mid Tang Dynasty about the end of 8th century, and he, uh, Lu Yu, the tea saint in China, we call Cha Sheng. And he only wrote about the, this drinking, this plant was known from Shen Nong, who, uh, like Shen Nong just said, that we just credit to everything to our great ancestors or mythical ancestors. And he didn't really mention how he found the tea. This uh, scenario, like he was poisoned and then lying down a big tree, it was only noted and added by the Qing Dynasty scholar, which means like 300 years ago. So that's a very true theory. We're exactly. from version to version, right? It, it yeah. like 60 poisons to 70 poison. To yeah. Like, yeah. Like, uh, you know, the widespread of what, um, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Chen Chai wrote on, oh, on yes, yes. yeah, that, that finally we kind of, in the modern time, we all settled on 72, but I don't think it matters from 60 to 72, yeah, yeah. You know, like, yeah, it was a lot of poisons, but that, that's what matters. <laughs> yeah. I, I like the end of this, I like, I like the end of the story of Shen Nong in that one, in that legend, that he died from taking one, uh, special poison grass called Duan Chang Cao. Actually, oh. like, uh, <laughs> so that, that killed him. That's a very interesting end for people who have just found the antidote for everything. So, oh, I want to fight all of this interesting or um, odd or bizarre <laughs> legends that believed or not believed by people. They still have been tested that um, being observed by Chinese ancestors that tea actually does have the med medical um, activities, such as they can uh, make people uh, make us awake. Already we know it's got because of caffeine and the, also the anti-infections, uh, antibacterial infections or something because they have the tea polyphenols. So sometimes, yes, the old myths really tell us some stories or telling us some principles very important us to know. So, well, I, I may not all believe into all this, especially about time they can date back so clearly, like the year and the month and the days. I don't really believe in that, but I do believe if this being told for being, being told for generations down, it definitely has something to it. We have we should definitely re research it. And also, by the way, uh, my uh, in, in our in our university, our T program, we do have a very big lab, a very big team of lab, uh, the scholars and the experts, uh, the doctors study uh, study into the medicinal use for tea. That's a very um, charming way of learning tea, but it's not our point today. And uh, also, uh, th and, uh, later on, uh, tea become to the beverage for the uh, masters, uh, the, 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 yeah, the masters, the, um, the hosts, to uh, treat uh, their guests, which was, uh, which was written and recorded by a scholar named Wang Bao. Uh, he lives in the, or in the mid, West Han Dynasty, like uh, one century before, uh, one, uh, yeah, one century before century. And at that period, and he wrote, wrote down one contract that he did with uh, one of his servants, which w w the whole story is very interesting that he, Wang Bao traveled to the Sichuan central, part, central part of Sichuan province, met a beautiful widow, and he wanted to marry the widow, but not the very, you know, very logical, uh, legal way, just, like very romantic way, and he uh, his action was not approved by one of the servants for the widow uh, who was served the widow's uh, late husband. So he Wang Bao, uh, Wang Bao, the scholar Wang Bao, who wrote a Tongyue a contract with a servant named Bian Liao to um, to 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 be, to make him feel like uh, you have to do to make the servant feel very. Um, a lot of labors to do and make him feel so uh, back downwards about the uh, to to stop the uh, the marriage between the Wang and the, the, the widow, and so in his contract he said about he have uh, the servant have to go to uh, the make the tea for the guest. That is the very first accurate 
re records for the tea drinking in Chinese history, especially the treat for the guest. This is the very first one I've been uh, certified with other evidences, including a, a very famous, uh, ver uh, yeah, very famous archaeologist proofs uh, five years ago, in, found in 2015, that in one actual empire's tomb of Han Dynasty, who buried himself with the some tea leaves inside his tomb. Uh, that's very uh, interesting, very important, found in whole Chinese history. Uh, of tea that changed a lot of things and also certifies a lot of things. Yeah. And uh, so that's began, this is the beginning of the Chinese people who drink tea in, rather than eating tea and uh, using it as a medicine. And this one, uh, and I'll follow up, I'll follow up the Wang Bao's records in 59 year, uh, 59 year BC. Uh, we have other documents like the Sun Guo Zhi, uh, the records of three kingdoms written in the third third century, late third century, uh, who, uh, the, by the scholar who named uh, Chen Shou, uh, the Chen Shou, who, and also in, in one, he, one of his episodes, um, one of his chapter about Wu Guo, the southern kingdom called Wu Guo, by the third century, uh, one of the uh, officer was uh, like showing this picture, which is definitely the imaginary picture. We don't really have the photo by then. And uh, he, he, he was, he, um, uh, yeah, uh, Wei Yao, uh, Wei Yao, he, he, the officer Wei Yao, who served for the Wu king, uh, king of the Wu king kingdom. And he is not quite, uh, quite uh, capable of drinking wine. So the, uh, the king of the Wu, who was served, who gave him the, tea as a substitute drink for wine. This is the very first way of Chinese people saying uh, using tea as a substitute drink for wine. Despite the wine, by that time, it's not very strong at all. It's almost like beers, the same by same category of the alcohol, like the beer. Still, this officer, he is very uh, trusted by the king. So the king gave him the tea instead of the wine to uh, to prevent him from making himself a joke in the banquet or somewhere. Yeah, so yeah. this is very interesting. And during this period, people drink tea with a way of boiling. Boil the tea, uh, in Chinese, we, refer, uh, we later refer to zhu cha. And the way, is, the way of processing the tea is very interesting. It's not like that we have now, like with, with water is deep, the tea leaves. By then, the tea leaves may not be dried uh, before the boiling or other processing way uh, for making way for drinking as whatsoever. And uh, we, Chinese people could, uh, we could boil the fresh and or the dried tea with a lot of ingredients, which is quite dark <laughs> for now, as in Chinese we call an hei liao li, like the dark cuisine. This is very, uh, very um, bizarre for China, for people to understand now, like drinking tea with ginger, uh, with green scallion, with uh, orange peel. And this way of, this will make tea leaves totally taste not like tea leaves at all. Um, I tried this with some of my friends for just curiosity and definitely curiosity didn't kill our cats, but kill ourselves pretty much. <laughs> That's not very tasty at all. It, all despite all the ingredients like ginger, scallions, and orange peels, we still, uh, according to the ancient books, we need to add up the salt, the butter. And this is not very pleasant for nowadays. Maybe it's because we cannot use, we don't really use the tea uh, exactly right as the way it was, like the fresh or uh, sun-dried way without processing like we do today, like uh, steam it or uh, fry it or somehow. Right. So I this is very interesting. A, yeah. It's a natural progression from going from food to yeah. a, in a to bag. drink. Right. Yeah. I, I think it's very important to, to know that, you know, so, so we're talking about, remember, chapter zero. So this is pre down Tang Dynasty. Mm -hmm. And in this period, we're still we're basically observing this transition for, for tea going from food to a standalone beverage. So in between, it's like this, this beverage that's still going from a soup is like tea is like, yeah. do I want a soup like or do that. I want to be, you know, just a drink? And also going back to using tea as a substitute for wine, um, it's still a custom widely accepted in China nowadays, right? Uh, so if you yeah. ever attend like a um, former formal dinner, uh, if you ever 
done a formal dinner with Chinese, you know that drinking yeah. is almost uh, compulsory, right? You, you have to drink. And there's so much meanings behind uh, a drinking. So uh, a very polite way to turn that down, uh, your host might not accept that, but a way to turn it down would to say, uh, like I'm yeah, substituting exactly. wine with tea. Um, because it's actually uh, customary to do so. And I was actually thinking maybe after this, we should all do a challenge uh, <laughs> to, to, to uh, with the, the scallions and gingers and the uh, orange peel and then see how that turns out. Uh, and but I want to mention, uh, again, just relating to today's tea world where we see like a xiao qinggan where people stuff it with yeah. the, um, green citrus. It's not the same thing. Totally not. It's totally not. It's not to mistaken this part of the history was history of that tea. All right. Okay, uh, let's keep going. So, uh, just to now advise everyone to try, maybe try to use this ingredient to make yourself a tea. Just don't forget about the salt and the butter. <laughs> you can try that. Yeah, that maybe um, you turn out just um, the way I you try. like it. Yeah. We don't know. <laughs> Do you know if it's um, uh, cow, the butter from, from cow or from, from sheep? Um, but I think it's cow. Okay. I think it's cow. Maybe water it's buffalo. A, kind of maybe. A, maybe. Kind of a lot of water buffalo. That's more <laughs> viable, I feel like. Yeah, yeah maybe. Uh, so. Okay, let's, let's keep going. <laughs> because we, we should not hand, uh, hand in this over for a very long time. And so finally, let's go to the first chapter of two Chinese people really drinking about tea in Tang Nan's tea, uh, which lasts from the early 7th century to the early 10th century, almost 300 years. And even at the first beginning of the Tang Nan's tea, people actually accepted Zhu Cha Bao, like bowling of the tea um, style, is quite much. Because by then, a lot of people were drinking tea as a very special uh, agricultural product from the Sichuan province and this uh, was only accepted by some uh, elites of the, of the society and because by then there are no much tea gardening, tea plantation like we have now a days. But during, by the Tang Dynasty, by the mid Tang Dynasty about uh, 750 to 780 AD and this time tea plantation uh, has grown into the almost same area of we have now today, which means like one third of Chinese land, Chinese ter territory can, uh, can be uh, the can be a tea plantation. So with the amount a great uh, a great volume of uh, increasing for tea production, every a lot of people can afford tea. Not just the royal family, not just the, uh, the aristocracy and all uh, the noble people, but also the uh, famous scholars people like Lu Yu, the saint of Chinese tea history, uh, the very first one who wrote about the classic of tea we just mentioned. And in his book, Lu Yu promote his way of thinking, not just by, um, not invented by his thought uh, that people should using adopt the Jian Cha style, which only add salt, a little touch of salt into the tea soup to make it feel a little fresher. Um, but um, uh, not, not just him, it's a lot of people's effort from Xi Jin, uh, from Du Yu, the uh, scholar who lived uh, 200 years ago before Lu Yu, which means like the sixth, uh, four, fifth century, mid fifth century. And uh, from Du Yu and to Lu Yu, there are a very long time gap for Chinese history to fill up in for now, even for our uh, further uh, researching that how people transition from the Zhu Cha tea, uh, Zhu Cha style, the bowling style, to the Jian Cha style uh, promoted by Lu Yu and um, became the mainstream of tea drinking in ma methods in Tang Dynasty, not, uh, which is accepted also not just by the, uh, the elite people, also the other, um, like the, the workers, the laborers, and other people who are drinking like tea. They, we, they accept the concept of drinking tea. Right. And oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. a second here. So um, I just want to mention uh, a little bit about Jian Cha. So Jian Cha, uh, if you just interpret from the word, so literally in, in, it can be translated to grilling the tea. Okay. And we'll gonna see later why, uh, you know, why it's called that. Uh, but we didn't, you know, I think it's much better to just call it Jian Cha instead of call it grill, grilled tea because it's, it's, it's no, a little it's bit different. Even though that's a terminology. And um, 
and here is also Jinta. If you drink Chinese uh, Japanese tea, you notice that this oh, is ben. that kanji that's on Sencha. So um, so Sencha is Jinta, but not. Uh, so I just wanted to, to mention <laughs> that maybe can be yeah. Uh, yeah, the same word, but. Uh, and it had its history root actually based on this particular jian cha that we're talking about. However, today's jian cha does not equal, today's jian cha, which is Japanese sencha, does not equal to the jian cha that we're going to talk about. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for uh, catching up for Shuna, the um, jian cha sencha as a tea name in Japan, which is a st uh, steamed green tea, uh, can be still found nowadays. Of course, it's very important product for Japan. But jian cha style, jian cha style of tea tea processing or tea making, making of tea, cup of tea, is not the same thing. It's more about the just boiling boiling the tea in the pot for a short time. Uh, controversy to the versus to the boiling methods of Zhu Cha Fa Zhu Cha style is just can boil, boiling the tea in the pot with other ingredients for a long time that which will give away all the tea um, refreshing flavors and the so Lu Yu and also other scholars before him promoted the Jian Cha style which will only boil the tea in the pot for a very long period, a very, very short period, a very short period with only salt that will enhance the flavor of teas, uh, especially the refreshing way and also the original way of uh, the flavor of tea, which could be a little bit bitter and <laughs> stringent, but still loved by the scholars, especially literature scholars like Lu Yu and other poets in Chinese history, including Li Bai and Du Fu and Bai Xu Yi, of course. They all have this kind of like a fair, uh, the preference to tea rather than wine in some occasion, only in some occasion. In the occasion, maybe they need to <laughs> think very logically. Died for, for, for being too drunk. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, so the okay. names that Wen Tian mentioned, these are all um, basically very famous Chinese poets in Tang Dynasty. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm not very familiar with my no, mouth. And um, this, uh, this is what with Chinese people will have in Tang Dynasty in the mid, uh, uh, in the mid late eighth century. For if you are Chinese by then, you can only found two kinds of tea by then. Uh, there are two kinds of steamed tea, uh, green tea, of course, all of them are green tea. Uh, jian cha, I know it's our luzhen tea, we call it san cha, uh, and the tea cakes. The san cha, luzhen tea, can be rather rough, even without a steam, just some dried, uh, or cu cha, as we call it in Chinese, like the way we're saying cu cha dan fan, which uh, the very rough tea and very mild uh, Food, so which means it represents a very simple life, simple life of China's yeah, poor, very poor life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. being so poor, poverty. Also, um, yeah, being being contrasted with the other lifestyle, yeah. which is jin yi yu shi, right? So oh, they, yeah, yeah, like you, you're uh, wearing, with eating, with like basically, yeah, fancy clothes and then like um, uh, gourmet food. Versus on mm -hmm. the other hand, you can be tu cha dan fan, so you're just like having rough tea and um, very simple, uh, almost flavorless food. Usually they mean like lack of uh, animal protein. So this can either mean, depending on the context, it can either mean that it, you're poor or it can mean that you are willingly choosing, uh, choosing that kind of life to represent like a simple uh, living. Yeah, and also this this kind of that uh, loosened tea we found in uh, there there were used to be in Tang Dynasty now can was inherited by one of the very famous Chinese green tea steamed green tea still is Enshi Yulu and it will always be rolled into the needle shift, and this is also adopted by the uh, gr a Japanese green tea is called uh, Gyoklo. Yeah, now we recommended in, in previous uh, emails for the tea we can you guys can have uh, this for, this is the same uh, same thing because Yulu in Chinese in Chinese is also the Gyuklo in Japanese this written written as the same character already but this is not the very major type of tea product in Tang Dynasty actually uh, in by then the real major uh, or the real real hit for the tea. Uh, tea product is actually the tea cake. 
the tea cakes is uh, having the shape like the round cake, like with the, um, the coins. And uh, similar to Chinese coins, which has a, uh, a little hole in the center of the tea cake. That, that, was, uh, that was actually caused by the different, a very special way of drying it in Chinese tea process history, which is not adopted by Chinese people nowadays anymore. Uh, during, during the processing uh, the, the, for the tea cakes, people have to steam it and to, um, to make it soften, to soften it and then press it into the cakes, it's the round cake shape, and have to use in a sticks, uh, mostly a bamboo stick, to pierce inside of the tea cake and hang them like a kebab, like just like a kebab together yeah. inside. <laughs> yeah, that's skew, right? Yeah, very like skew. And uh, hanging it in um, rows and rows and rows in the very um, square um, oven or something, mostly making uh, with the uh, bamboo ships. But we don't really have that archaeology uh, proof. We only have the, recommend, uh, the documents and the records. So probably we'll find something new in the future because we already have on the tea utensils we have, we now can see for, for Tang Dynasty. Um, in Tang Dynasty for the Jian Cha style, the most important utensil is actually uh, the, the, uh, the grinders, uh, the, 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 like the trough like grinders and the sifter, like we, what we have shown here. Uh, in some video clips, in the later video clips we're going to show for you guys, uh, all this stuff will mo almost make in the ceramics or the bamboo or the wood. But actually, we can see here in the bottom picture, this is a archaeology foundings, uh, the archives from the date back to the late Tang Dynasty, owned by an emperor, real emperor, like Tang Xizong, which is not a very good emperor either way. <laughs> <laughs> Collection. This collection is really good because all of this was made in the brown. Uh, we, we made in the brown the bronze, and and, cut and uh, glazed with silver and gold. Very very luxury. And this this piece was found in, in the 1987. Very late now. Yeah, the same year. Not very good news. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, it was found in the Famen Si Temple, the uh, the burial uh, the burial uh, palace of Famen Si Temple, which uh, with the, the emperor himself giving away this tea uh, giving this tea uh, tea set owned by himself to um, to as uh, to, for for the Shi Li. You know what I mean? So Shi Li is basically a a, ah, a yeah. sacred item in Buddhism and. Oh, yeah. Can be there can be many different kinds, but the most common one is usually uh, the crystallized revenants after mm -hmm. a um, uh, enlightened uh, monk has died, and then the the body is um, uh, is burned, and then so in the ash you can find these crystallized items, and then those are considered sacred. Uh, so that would be one form of shili, and it's actually uh, if if it does exist, then people will usually build a tower around it to celebrate that. Yeah, so after the, the town dynasty bureaucratic, uh, the town officers uh, welcomed or the uh, escort the uh, She Li back to the capital of uh, town dynasty, the Chang'an, which is known as Xi'an city. Uh, they buried uh, lots of things, precious things, including the emperor's own collection of tea set uh, with the She Li and built up the whole temple for it. It's called Fa Men Si and lots of other uh, very royal family thing and very luxury. So this actually contradicts to the uh, other records for the tea drinking, uh, like the tea classic, the, where the, oh, in which the Lu Yu said, uh, people should use the ceramics, uh, so people should use the processing uh, tea balls and using the wooden and using the bamboo instead of that. But we can, so we can see the different uh, differentiality of the royal family's life to the normal people's life by then. But still, uh, this classic tea uh, written by Lu Yu actually giving out the basic tune for Chinese tea drinking after Tang Dynasty. But maybe, uh, because in, during the Tang Dynasty, especially the early years or before Tang Dynasty, tea is only being consumed by the royal family or the aristocracy uh, very close to the family which is also a very big symbol for people who is close to the yeah. emperor or not. So after the Midtown Dynasty, with the volume increasing and the 
promoters like the Lu Yu uh, who are promoting the tea culture very hardly, very hard. Uh, so people started to accept tea as a ordinary drink. So that is why now Chinese people believe that drinking tea is a way of sim uh, symbolizing for the simple life, very simple life, not very uh, elegant yet simple, not very luxury ways. Well, right. um, um, yeah, this is very interesting. The, the yeah. transition for this from the, the go to the pop proselyte. Right, so yeah. this set, um, uh, it's in the museum right now. Yeah, it's in the museum, in the Famous Museum. And, and if people go visit China, do we know where they can go see this set? Yes, of course, they should go to the Xi'an city. Uh, it's, uh, I think, the Fufeng County, northwest to the Xi'an city. Well, if you guys actually travel to China, yeah, uh, I think you know China yeah, is a most popular see. destination for for people oh, who go to China because the Paragon of Warrior. Yeah, so I think if yeah. you go there, um, go to that museum. And yes, especially uh, for uh, one. For instance, I've heard about the Xi'an touristing, uh, tour, touristing, touristing something. People should definitely go to Xi'an if you want to learn something before ninth century of China. If you really want to know the early age of the Chinese history or Chinese uh, history of Chinese civilization, you should definitely go to see and it's a very big part of it. Maybe not very glar glamorous as the uh, Shanghai or Beijing or fancy like Shenzhen. Well, the, my, my hometown city is actually a very, um, I, I always feel like, yeah, yeah, proud of it. yeah history. It's a, it's, a, it's a very ancient capital city. Uh, of yeah. course, and you know, uh, the dynasty that's a little closer to our time, they have since moved the capital to other cities. Um, but still, you know, Xi'an is, is uh, uh, one of the early glories. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're one of the early glory. And uh, of course, uh, we can see very special uh, things. I, oh, sorry, I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, list it on my list here in my slideshow. And it's this way, it's called Cuo Gui, the salt uh, plat. A salt plat. This is a very, very interesting um, utensil that only found one. This one, only one and piece, oh, only one and only piece in yeah. all Chinese ancient history, date back to Tang Dynasty. That this is the only uh, salt plate for uh, for now we have found. Uh, this was a cover with a cover and with a handle, a, a lid. Uh, there's a lid and also uh, there there is a uh, the, the plate with the, the food. The set above the, the table, and because by then the yen, the salt itself, is very precious ingredient. Also in Chinese history, that and that's only also a reason why Chinese people call dan fan as an unsalted uh, food as a symbol for a very poverty or something. Because salt <laughs> is very uh, precious already by then. Yeah. By the way, you know, salt is so precious back in the days in China, and it was often, you know, it's it's a it's a item controlled by the government, which is actually uh, throughout the world. Um, yeah. It's also a tightly controlled uh, item by the government, and to the point, uh, smuggling salt was a dire crime. You know, it was like one of the 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 most uh, like it's public pu punished by some of the most severe the corporate punishment in um, yeah in Chinese. Um, uh, law system back in the days. So back in the days, if you say you're a salt smuggler, it's it's almost the equivalent to say you know you're like a drug dealer, like a bigger like a uh, like a yeah drug person uh, nowadays. Yeah. Like, you're just like that badass because <laughs> it's one of the worst. Um, it's one of the most dangerous crimes one can do back in the days. Exactly the private salt and then later in the late Tang Dynasty, the uh, the private or the tea smuggler were also facing this quite similar punish with um, like whipping or uh, like the, 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 how say, the hitting and even to, even to the, you know, beheaded. So it's very important to, uh, to have to maintain, to get to the salt or the tea by, back to Tang Dynasty. And also other, other pieces for the tea utensils in Tang Dynasty. There are, this is a sifter. This is a, and also only a silver, a silver glazed sifter, tea sifter in the Tang uh, archives, uh, yeah, things. and also that this is uh, the very royal way of seeing the tea grinder uh, versus to uh, the, the future, uh, the later ones we're going to see in the video clip. And the tea balls as well, as, of course, very important for tea drinking. In Tang Dynasty, there are two major style of tea balls. One is from the southern part of China, we call it Nanqing, like the, the, the green proselyte tea balls from the 
uh, from the southern part of China and versus to the uh, north white waste. That basically because the different two uh, mineral mi mineral mines that lies in the that lie in the southern part of China and the north part of China, uh, we have different uh, glazed mines. Uh, like in the north is uh, mo almost the white, and later found other types. And the you know, southern part is al always the green, which is still green. That is also believed now in Chinese people by the Chinese people that uh, you should definitely use a green colored uh, tea, porcelain tea ball to, to drink green tea, because that this will make the tea looks greener and more close to its original color. And this, uh, this thought was supported by Lu Yu as himself, who is of course a southerner of Chinese, a southern Chinese. And uh, the way of drinking tea, uh, sorry, uh, during Tang Dynasty, the processing flow is like baking the tea, tea cake to dry, because for the tra uh, transportation, during transportation, the tea can be, uh, you know, get humid or something. So before drinking it, one should definitely bake it to dry and then crush it and grind it in the tea, uh, gr crush and gr grind it, sift it into, uh, sift the pieces to the small, uh, small pieces like the couscous. Not very, not, not very small compared to the song that, the song style. Like a, like a very rough grind. It's not yeah. a fine grind. And as you not saw, very fine grind. Yeah, and you're gonna, so we saw in the utensils, but we're also gonna see in the video later, it was like this, like a choke looking thing with a, with a wheel, so you grind it like this, instead of yeah, later, you fill it, which is much finer. Yeah, and then boil the water to about 90 degrees. Uh, in ancient time, we don't have thermometer, we just only by detecting the, the, the shape for the tea, for the water to boiling with the small bubbles and the big bubbles with small bubbles coming up around the water, a water edge that will be probably like 90 degrees. Um, and then later, uh, let, let out the tea into the pots and share it to everyone else. So uh, enough talking, let's see some uh, from the video clips. So this is uh, the tea stove and the, uh, also this is a tea, uh, the, the charcoal, charcoal tones and that's a tea tones. And you use this to the, to yep. the clothing because this is also very representative of what people yep. actually look like which might be different from what you think Chinese people uh like the clothing and everything looks like yeah so that was yeah. like the iron thing was like a big pincer you basically grab the tea and then kind of grill it over over fire yeah mm -hmm. yeah and this is a very special tea tongue only using in Jian Cha style where people using this to uh, swirl inside of the tea, uh, tea soup, we can see it later. Oh yeah, this is the trough-like grinder. Yeah. And earlier that was a wax paper bag that you can store the tea. And this is a stroke for um, people to, to, to remove the tea powder to the sifter from the, from the tea grinder. And this is sifter. This is a measure, a tea scoop, a very ancient tea scoop. And this is a water barrel. Yeah, it's water, water, like scoop, <laughs> scoop. <laughs> yeah, so it's like a half a gourd, basically. Yeah. All natural. And this is, wait, uh, the, the salt holder different tea balls, then we can see in this tea balls, this, this are, these are the, the north, northern styles. And oh, those two tea balls. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah the cloth to clean the vessels. Charcoal. Yeah, have to make. And the charcoal was, uh, this was using as the uh, olive charcoal. Yeah. yeah, charcoal in Chinese uh, tea culture, like different charcoal is very, um, like there are, there are a lot of details about charcoal as well. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and this is the classic saying in Louis' classics of tea, basically, you know, the spring water is the best and then river water and well water is the last.
That's a cape. Yeah, so it says steam tea. And yeah, press. Yeah, steam. And press. Oh. Uh, so here they are actually using a modern tea of, of Zhangping Shui Xian as an example, right? But but just know that this was not this is not how it used to look like. But it's the perfect oh, yeah. to grill and and put it on a pincer. See, and the cover of put the tea cake actually is what well, was like it. Obviously, this is a modern <laughs> paperback. <laughs> See this tea sifting to um, certain uh, pieces. Flow to water. Yeah. And yeah, people believe there, you know, different water boiling is, is, is uh, different levels of water boiling has an impact on the, on the tea. And they usually, by observing the water or by actually listening to the water to know if how done the water is. Yeah. And they'll say if the water is too raw or too ripened. I know this is, again, the very confusing way for Chinese to use the <laughs> word raw or ripened. Basically, like if you have, have to have a thermometer. <laughs> yeah. All right, oh, here, if you um, are gonna do uh, you know, the, the tea uh, at home here, uh, you know, talks about how uh, the proportion of water to tea to, to, to water, uh, to salt is, you know, something that's very different. Oh, and if it's like a fish eye, that's the first pointing. Oh, that's salt. Yeah, and now you can taste your water to see if you salt it to your likeness. <laughs> if it's too salt, just add more water. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Yeah, and then like you want to boil it until they're like consistent foam uh, that come up. That's the second boil. And you scoop, scoop it up. And now you add tea. <laughs> yeah, and it's a one liter of uh, 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 water. Uh, you need about one square inch of tea or a cubic inch of tea. And this is third boil. And now you not need to add back the second boil to yeah, to stop, stop the boiling. Yeah. And then uh, they're saying, you know, the foam is considered a precious part of the of the tea. Yeah. And they're just talking about the different name for the uh, the the foam in the soap soup. And you're only supposed to do this for five times, right? After five times, like it's it's no longer tasty. After the, I guess the five uh, scheming of the foam is no longer tasty. <laughs> Here's the the man's attire. <laughs> Just so I know, <laughs> you're you're off well. yeah, but, <laughs> I know we're digressing, but I want to hear because uh, right here, if we can squeeze right here. Um, uh, let's look at the, the, the sleeve, the big opening sleeve. Yeah. This is a very, uh, back in the days, this is a very important uh, separation of a traditional Chinese clothes versus what Chinese will call a barbarian clothes is how big the, the sleeve opening is, right? So basically, <laughs> it's purposely really inconvenient. So um, you don't basically have to do things versus the... Uh, Chinese believe that barbarians already have to ride horses every day. Uh, everything has to be very tight on you. So they would consider uh, a Chinese dress would be things just basically loose, and you literally can can function other than look pretty in those clothes. Yeah, just wanted to mention that. <laughs> so that's the big, and that's the pocket too. People will literally, you know, put things in that. Yeah, they can sew a po pocket onto into the sleeves actually for the like when we have like a pocket. <laughs> So this is the uh, this is the little clip that we showed for you guys about the how the Dian Cha is down. Of course, this is being um, performed by the modern people with uh, recording, and uh, we can since the the Dian Cha style already died out um, in during the mid North Song Dynasty and uh, North mid uh, Nan Song uh, South Song Dynasty era. Uh, so we can now only using our imagination with so many. <laughs> 
maybe incorrect uh, details for the tea drinking, but this one is probably the closest I can get for the ancient internet resources. And uh, after Tang Dynasty, there's a huge, uh, there's a whole new chapter for tea drinking in Song Dynasty because one major logical uh, logic of tea drinking is changed. In Tang Dynasty, what we saw from the video clip that people adding to the tea powder inside the water, and in Song Dynasty, it was it was backward that like people putting the tea powders into the tea balls and then using the water, adding the water to the tea powders. So this vice versa actually become as the uh, this, I'm sorry this uh, this uh, revi this changing uh, trans transformation actually uh, leading uh, leading to our modern tea drinking as Pao Cha style uh, happened uh, invented or uh, innovated in the Ming Dynasty alongside with the changing of the tea production a uh, tea pro tea processing for the tea product. So like in Song throughout Song Dynasty area from uh, sorry from the late 10th century to the late 13th, 13th century, uh, we actually have three tea drinking style during the whole period. One is Zhu Cha Ba style, still, uh, because boiling tea uh, you, or making tea as a porridge or the broth uh, was still inherited by Chinese people in the by other, some minority groups of Chinese people nowadays can be still found. And uh, they, this, way, this way is very, uh, easy to it's very easy to conduct and the ingredients and the, also the soup is very um tasty uh, it, it, it's not very tasty not with the ginger or scallion <laughs> not the way of doing that anymore those uh, tasty tea soup or tea broth can be very uh comfort comforting for different people in different uh, health conditions somehow so it's been still inherited and jian cha fa can be still uh found in the early no, uh, north south uh, north song that Dynasty or North Northstone era or Southstone era, it can still be found, but it's not very major ones. Uh, during the gap time gap from the 907 to 980s, 960s, um, those those 15, uh, 60, almost 60 years long period in Chinese history is also very um, very savage, <laughs> very brutal, very bloody, bl bloody, but still very, um, I say beautiful time of Chinese history because a lot of things change alongside with the war between the warlords uh, with the chaos between the uh, different people that lives on the Chinese territory nowadays uh, so uh, so uh, was uh, innovated by invented by the southern part of uh, Chinese uh, southern part of the Song uh, territory that then was called Mingguo like now that's Fujian province or Fujian, Fujian province uh, yeah. They originated with the Dian Cha style, yeah. uh, which uh, we're also the Fukin, Fukin province, where is also the very center of tea processing uh, or tea making and uh, tea manufacturing in Song throughout Song, Song period in, until today. So, this province is very important. It's not only giving us a new tea drinking style, also giving us a lot of new tea product uh, during the Qing dynasty, Ming Qing dynasty, including the very famous black tea. Uh, very universal or <laughs> the global tea drink uh, black tea. It was invented in the Fujian or Fujian province nowadays. And so this Dian Cha Fa then became the mainstream of tea drinking methods since mid Song, mid North Song era, about uh, the beginning of the 11th century. And the tea for Dian Cha style is basically the same product, but with different Appearance and the, somehow, sometimes mixed with other ingredients. Uh, normally, the North, uh, North Song style tea product is like the steamed green tea and tea cakes pressed. Of course, for the royal family, they have to press with the ro uh, royal symbols in Chinese history, in Chinese civil uh, culture, uh, which means dragons and phoenix. This Chinese dragons like looks like this, uh, quite similar to the python and very interesting way of adding up to the, all the mystical creature and also the phoenix, which rep mostly represent to the female figures for the royal family. So Long Feng Tuan Cha uh, basically means dragons and phoenix uh, round, round shaped tea, tea cakes. is very important tea product that was um, country attributed to the royal family from the Fujian province, which uh, where, where, the, where their, um, the tea 
drinking styles of Dian Cha found uh, invented by uh, invented and also being very popular, uh, quickly very popular in the whole uh, North Asian region, not just China, not just China, and including the Japan and the Korean and uh, uh, Peninsula was also influenced by this tea drinking style. Yeah. And in this style, the utensils actually was very, it was consulted a lot, a lot, uh, quite much. Uh, in Lu Yu Cha Jing, uh, in Cha Jing, the tea classic, the classic tea, uh, Lu Yu mentioned about 24 types, uh, 24 pieces for the utensils. But in Nan Song, in this, uh, in the, in this northern, uh, south, south Song era, there are only about 12 pieces. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot, uh, it's, it's much simple, much simple, much simpler than the, uh, than the way it was in Tang Dynasty. So um, in, throughout history, we can see the drink, way of drinking, tea drinking is, def is definitely the way of, especially for Chinese people, it's a way of concession. It's becoming simpler and simpler. And so that is how tea become more popular to every class, uh, every classes of the, in the society, every people. So like in Chinese, we say the tea is from the bottom of the society to the uh, very highest place or high statue, st status of the society. And the major tea drinking methods in Song Dian Cha style is like bla a black glazed tea bowl like this one. And we can see here, it was made from the Fujian province, <laughs> where, where we call Jian Yang. Uh, still, still now a city. Still, is still now a city, and very famous of making, uh, processing, um, sorry, manufacturing the tea, uh, tea cups and tea bowls. Um, the, they are very special because in, in the whole Chinese tea drinking history, this is the only type of black glazed. Normally, Chinese people, especially now in recent years or in recent centuries, dynasties, from Ming Dynasty, people like to using the white ones to reflect the color of the tea soup. But in, only in Song Dynasty, there's only uh, about two to three hundred years long period, and people would like to using the black glazed tea balls. That be, that is because what we saw in the aesthetic um, feature for the tea uh, form was enhanced a lot by the way of a whisker whisking the tea of uh, tea soup to create a lot of spoons, and the foams is basically to be. It's, it's believed to be the white ones. So the white color foam come to, uh, come to, uh, how's it, compared to the yeah, black like glazed tea balls. Yeah. yeah. And of course, and, and during Song Dynasty, for the methods of Dian Cha style, the, uh, which will require the tea powder to be more fine grind. So that is, what, that is when Chinese people in, invented a small meal only for the tea drinking. This is the, the, the trough-like uh, the, the trough -like, uh, grinder. And then later we have, people have to using the meal to make it to grind to even smaller powders that could actually, uh, how to say, the floating inside the tea soup when, when the tea soup is still warm. So the, when people drinking it, you can feel the very smoothy foam and then a very, very, um, a very, a very little uh, in some say very very little touch for the tea powders that will not affect you at all. So this is very interesting, and also also the tea whisk. It can be now seen in mostly in the Japanese tea ceremony, and which is distilled from the North Song Dian Cha style, and then uh, you know of course uh, transformed to the Japanese style. This it was um, inherited something from from Chinese culture, but it's totally different ones. And also a very interesting long spout bottle only for the Dian Cha style because they have to add in the water time and time again. Sometimes, sometimes even uh, some, some people believe that seven times the fast, which is also showed in the little middle clip. And some people believe it can be shorter, uh, less or somehow. But still the bottle is important, uh, changing for the tea, um, tea, tea making as well. Yeah, and I noticed that um the 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 kettle uh, mm -hmm. has like a gooseneck spout, right? So it's yeah. very similar to uh, the uh, the kettle that you want to use to make a pour over coffee right now. Um, it's basically right. also to help better control how the water comes out. So from this, what you can see that it has um, a, a lot has shifted to what's best for tea, right? 
um, more to the detail even about controlling the water flow to the teeth. We want the teeth to be finer. And when we make the teeth, we want it to look prettier. Um, and also from, um, uh, here, here's another point I also want to clarify because we get asked this question a lot is exactly when um, the tea went from China to Japan and you can see that as almost two distinct events right so in Tang Dynasty there was a monk that so there was a record about a monk taking tea plant from China to Japan and then we, 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 we haven't heard anything from them since then. they didn't write back and then and then in Song Dynasty, uh, we know that the style of tea drinking became, uh, that, that transferred to Japan. And obviously we know what happened then. They, you know, uh, Japanese, they, they, they carry on this tradition and later develop tea ceremony around the style of tea drinking. And even now today, we usually associate matcha with uh, Japanese tea drinking. So that's, that's basically two different things. It's not a continuity. It's not like the the monk from Tang Dynasty went back to Japan and, and he told somebody to, hey, go back to, to Stone Dynasty again and then see what they're doing now. So it's, it's, it's two different things, yeah. Yeah, to, to add that, uh, uh, the history of between the uh, Sino-Japan communication actually started from the sixth century uh, in the Sui Dynasty, uh, before the Tang Dynasty. And then uh, it, it continues but how some, somehow stopped, opposed by the chaoses of 16 chaos years of Chinese history, we call it Wu Dai Shi Guo, five generations and 10 kingdoms uh, between the Tang and the Song Dynasty. And after the Song Dynasty, the, Song, uh, the, the Zhao regime uh, claimed the, the crown and the, the communication between Japan and China actually start again. And this, this uh, Dian Cha style uh, was transformed uh, or was, um, uh, spread to the Japanese, to, to the Japan, to the Japanese royal family uh, by the uh, Japanese monk named uh, Rong Xi Chan Shi, I forgot his <laughs> Japanese name, but also, also a monk, very famous monk who wrote a book about, uh, in, about um, absorbing, uh, eating tea uh, for your health. It's called Chi Cha Yang Sheng Ji, and that dates back to the 10th, uh, 11th century to 12th century during that era. So basically, if uh, the, accurate, the accurate time for tea uh, to be known by the Japanese people is actually during the Tang Dynasty, of course, uh, where the emperor of Tang, Tang regime to giving a present to the, the, to, to the Tenno, to the Tenno Heka. And also the, uh, but this is it's quite different from the later uh, methods that was invented or innovated by the Japanese people themselves. We call now as matcha, matcha, or the chayono, uh, different way of the Japanese saying. I don't really <laughs> very expert about this. And so after that, uh, we can see the different uh, methods of uh, different styles of the tea. Uh, Dian cha, uh, dian cha to dian cha tea style. Uh, firstly, they also start from the baking the tea cakes, but in dian cha style, one have to baking the tea balls as well. Because if, we, if you don't really, if you don't uh, giving the tea ball a, a great heat, um, the tea soup will be growing, will be, um, be getting cold very quickly. And hence, the tea powders will just getting down to, uh, to just to sink down to the bottom of the teacup, which is very unpleasant to drink. Uh, if you don't know where the feeling, just remember the way you, you the feeling that you're drinking the handmade um, dripping coffee. The very bottom of it is very, very, you know, the residue is very unpleasant. So to make the uh, tea powder to floating inside the tea soup, so you have to uh, heat the tea balls to a very high uh, to, to a very high temperature. So that is why people really need this jian tuo, the holder, which, uh, uh, which um, was distilled to the tea saucer, we know in the Ming Dynasty uh, from the Chinese, uh, both Chinese people adopt and also adopted by the European people. And then of course, break the tea cake, uh, grind it into the powder and sift the powder and make it very fine grind. Uh, pr pr pretty much similar to nowadays matcha's uh, size. Um, it's very small. And then boil the water, of course, the same way. Uh, so always the tea was, sorry, the tea was to be uh, infused or the made in the very uh, rather comparatively high temperature. 
of the water and then add the tea powder into the tea bowl and whisk it gradually and adding the water time and time again. So yeah. you can see this um, in the uh, repeated form, right? So huh? this is, oh yeah. Yeah, so it's not like uh, uh, nowadays that you, obviously, you know, you can, you can do it in uh, many different ways, but it's uh, 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 in a way that it's not like currently matcha where you whisk it and then it's served right away. Uh, we're going to see in a demonstration video uh, later that it can be done repeatedly. So, yeah. so you, uh, again, foam is treasured. Um, the foam not, is very treasured. <laughs> it was not the tea, but rather the foam. Um, yeah. And in this video, I just uh, would like everybody to pay uh, attention again to see how the uh, the attire uh, has changed again on um, these characters. And in Song Dynasty, you know, Tang Dynasty was a very lavish dynasty, right? It was also very mm -hmm. time where um, you know it's uh, it was not frowned upon if women show cleavage and stuff like that. And then later in Song Dynasty, not only uh, it become very conservative, but yet it was also considered a high time for uh, paintings and calligraphy and things like that. So it had this very own unique aesthetic style. Um, so 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 we'll pay attention to that, and you'll see how things has has changed from Qing, uh, from uh, Tang to Song Dynasty. So this is breaking the tea cakes. Oh, by the way, the tea they're using here is not a green tea, which is, uh, I don't know why. I think it's the, the <laughs> poor tea probably, the wild and poor tea, Fu Hua. Which is not what people used to do. Just, mm. I got mosquitoes with me. So this is the first, uh, first adding water. And you have to make it a little water and to foam and to, to whisk it into the um, a very sticky tea leaves, a, this very sticky soup or syrup like. Yeah, so it's almost, yeah, exactly. It's a syrup-like thing. And the second, second time. And this is a very important way of uh, forming the foam. But not just whisking. And notice how, uh, even though, I mean, it's supposed to be a, a green liqueur, so even though it's a darker color liqueur, but see how the color of the foam has changed, and it'll now make sense of why people use a black porcelain to, to really bring out the color contrast. So this is the, the crab eye is the goal of the foam size. So it was the, each, each round of whisking, there are different goals we're trying to achieve. So you know that you have done it right. I used to try this tea whisking. It's, it's not that easy. It really is not that easy. <laughs> My foam just gone immediately. Yeah. And so for this one, which is the fourth time, it's encouraged that you um, start to whisk with the greater movement and you want to have like this very airy, cloudy feeling with the foam now. This is uh, said to be a short whisk. And you are really trying to turn as much uh, liqueur into foam as possible. And uh, so who, who gave this instruction? Uh, it's according I think to this is from the, the work, uh, the tea book named Da Guan Cha Lun. 
like the T theories in Da Guan's year, uh, which is also a year for the Emperor Song Huizong, yes. Huizong yes. Emperor of Song Dynasty. It was written by himself, that emperor, who is a very bad emperor, but very good artist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Song Song Huizong is a very important emperor. Um, if you ever, you know, if you no matter if you study tea or study art, uh, he is actually yeah. considered one of the greatest artists Chinese ever had. Oh, but yeah. Actually not a great emperor though. Um, yeah, so this one if you're looking for for this particular one, you know, you want it to to have like a thick, uh, almost like mm -hmm. a cream consistency now. So he was a tea connoisseur. I know in the West a lot of people know about the classics of tea written by Lu Yu, but following that, I would say the most important, I was at least the most influential uh, tea yeah, book definitely. Ha Lun by him. Um, so. Uh, if you are interested, definitely read that. It's a very elitist um, book. So in the book, you know, he because well, he's an emperor, so so there are so many um, pet peeves he has about tea and you know, <laughs> telling other people how you did it all wrong. Yeah, there was some some of his thing I really despite on, but he is really a very very good artist. This this is not not very. There's nothing to you know disagree about that, but. Mm. Other parts just that is uh, with is also the yeah. final with in this video. And for this one, uh, you basically want like all the foam to just like come out, um, and it's almost like as if, as if the foam is coming out of the bowl, so so it's very saturated with foam basically. Right. Oh, that that is pretty much all this little clip. Uh, so today, so today we have this. Uh, sharing about the <laughs> sharing about the Jian uh, Cha style and Song and uh, Tang Dynasty and the Dian Cha style in Song Dynasty, which takes a lot of longer time than we expected, <laughs> almost like half hour longer than we expected. So next episode, we're going to share about the style of Pao Cha, the original style of Pao Cha style, uh, tea drinking in Ming Dynasty, and how this transmission from the Dian Cha style, very delicate, very, um, very delicate, very, um, very aesthetic way of tea drinking for the elites, for the noble family to transform, transmission, uh, transform to the very normal and daily basis tea drinking style of Pao Cha. So that is pretty much what I'm going to say. Thank you all. <laughs> Um, and also, um, I uh, wanted to just like uh, highlight that obviously we have uh, divided this um, uh, presentation into the chapter zero, one, and two. Uh, the reason it is that is because um, for uh, you know Chinese uh, tea culture, there is a uh, Tang Dynasty is, a, is is considered basically the the milestone uh, or the yeah. start of Chinese tea culture. So basically, pre that. Um, even though we have cultivated tea, we had drank tea, it was just not fine enough to, 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 to reach the same level that we actually appreciate tea uh, as we do today. So Tang Dynasty is really the start of, of it all. So I can't emphasize enough, in Chinese tea history, you have to make a distinction between Chinese, the history of Chinese cultivation of tea versus the history of Chinese tea culture, which actually starts with more attention paid to how well the tea is being made. So um, in Chinese, we'll say that the tea culture starts with Tang Dynasty and reaches its first height. Well, at the time, it would say it reached the height in Song Dynasty. But now, you know, we know it, it was just the first height, right? It was not the height. Um, yeah. So shall we get to some of the questions? Of course. Let's... Yeah. Okay, so um, under q and I'm going to search through the Q&A first. And um, well, uh, so the question is asking, first question was about the recording. So for the recording, um, if it was uh, recorded well, uh, we'll actually post it on T-Drum's YouTube channel. Um, so so it's basically you, uh, YouTube slash, I think, T-Drum's NYC. So uh, it'll be there. And then the next one, I uh, was talking about asking uh, uh, basically Wang Bao's uh, uh, hmm. why Lu Yu did not mention it. He, he mentioned it actually. He mentioned it in one chapter of his tea classic called Jiu Zhi Shi, like the stories about tea, uh, tea drinking and tea uh, and other, other archives, including Wang Bao's Tong Yue and also Du Yu and also Shen Nong, the, the myth of Shen Nong. 
the, he also mentioned it. So that is why the tea, the classic tea is called as classic tea, uh, because it already have uh, some uh, gathering up all the stories and tales and myth throughout Chinese history and especially the written records, including Wang Bao's uh, story. Yes, and um, so the classic of tea, uh, I know um, people are fascinated about the fog and, and, and Chinese people, we are as well. Um, just keep in mind, uh, you know, the, the, the style of tea that he talks about is no longer really applicable today. The, but it, the book is so important because it's the uh, really the first dedicated tea book, right? And it laid a foundation of how we're supposed to understand tea, where, uh, you know, he basically provided structure uh, around this set of knowledge. So you start with, you know, location, the towar, he talks about the, uh, the cultivar, the tea making, uh, you know, how you uh, are supposed to go about in brewing, steeping the tea, you know, the companies do you keep, the water, the vessel, and of also, you know, basically, uh, it's almost like his uh, reference of, you know, previous writings yeah. and things like that. So it's because of this, that's why it's such an important tea book. So when you read the book, um, don't, don't, don't buy into like, oh, the Lu Yu said we should do this and that's why we should do that in a way, but, but more or less, it, it provides a, a structure to understanding tea. All right, so the next one, is there a name of reference for the Han burial tea finding? Uh, just, um, uh, Han Chao's time, the Han Chao's time, which one is the name of the Han Chao? It's a tomb of Han Jing Di. It's called Han Yang Ling, like Yang Ling tomb uh, in Han Dynasty. He's the fourth emperor of the Han Dynasty, Western Han Dynasty. He lives around the 100, uh, 100 to 50, uh, to, no, 150 to 100 BC, around that period. Okay. It was before the Wu Di Emperor. So I'm gonna write Han Jing Di. Uh, yeah, Han Jing Di. Uh, so you can, um, uh, so I'm typing it in, and you can actually find this in the answered section. Um, uh, Hanjing Emperor. So if you can, you can find more information about this emperor just by uh, copy paste it and it'll, it'll come in Wikipedia. All right. Um, next one. I thought salt and butter came only with the Mongols after stone. Oh, um, just, 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 <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, obviously we always have salt. Um, and in terms of butter, uh, it, it's not very widely used in Chinese culinary, but yeah, but we also like have it. Yeah. This, um, this was yeah, uh, the the uh, the cow butter, uh, the, yeah, the cow butter but, or the buffalo butter had been used by Chinese people. We have we also have a different name. We just don't, don't name it as milk or butter. We name it like tea hu. Uh, yeah. In Chinese history, over there is a saying of tea hu guan ling means like. Wow, <laughs> just like a, a eureka, the feeling of eureka yeah. moment. That is actually uh, distilled from uh, Chinese Buddhism um, of using Buddhism gesture called uh, giving the um, the student a touch with the uh, butter or buffalo milk or the butter. So that why it's called ti hu. And also the ti hu or the luo jiao or lao jiao is also a comparing to the tea history with, with a very famous tea records named Luoyang Qie Lan Ji during the uh, uh, during its, uh, Nanbei Chao, the North and, North and South uh, dance tea era, uh, which is pre-Tang history, like uh, around 500 to 600, uh, no, 450 to 550 era. During that time, um, there were, there, there already have a lot of uh, records about Chinese people drinking milk uh, and also, also lots of other drink, uh, other things. But of course, uh, Ch China is not a very big, uh, especially the old Han density territory. They're not a very big uh, production area for the milk, but still they do have milk. Just not very uh, commonly used in the culinary nowadays. I, I type in uh, Luoyang Qie Lan Ji in, um, mm. Uh, in the in the answered section as well, but I can only type that in Chinese because I actually have no idea what it's translated into. Um, There's no translation for that book. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, Buddhism jargon, so I'm pretty sure there's a very specific translation, which I 
am not familiar with. And Luoyang is the name of a also a, a old capital city. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not Xi'an. It's a different one. No. All right. It's, it's cool. um, mm -hmm. uh, this question um, asks, where can you get fresh tea leaves? Can I use leaves of another type of camellia tree? Um, I, I think this is referring to if you want to make like a tea salad. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure where you can get fresh tea leaves here in the States. I have heard that there are vendors in Taiwan that they can uh, okay. use frozen uh, flash, uh, not flash, I guess it's just like a, a tea leaf that they somehow is able to keep, a, uh, keep it cool um, and then uh, ship to the States to you. In the, under the current you know, uh, climate, I don't know if uh, it's maybe it's not possible, but maybe after we got over the pandemic, it's possible again. And uh, if you're in New York City, um, there's some Thai restaurant, they actually have like a tea leaf salad. So if that's what you wanted to experiment with the fresh tea leaves, maybe you can Google which Thai restaurant in New York City has uh, uh, the, uh, the tea leaf salad. I, I haven't had it, but I've heard uh, some of the guests talk to me about it. Mm. Um, so here in the Tian Cha style, it says steam. Is that the processing? The Tian Cha style, we use the steamed green tea, which the processing flow is quite similar to the processing charts with the Japanese uh, steamed green tea. Oh, those, all those also have also still uh, being processed in China, but the different way uh, is uh, focused on the different shaping uh, style shipping uh, processing during the Tang Dynasty. There's only a roughly steamed to, like nearly cooked tea leaves uh, to get a, get away with the the odor of the grassy old uh, grassy smell from the tea leaves and uh, mild uh, cooked. Oh uh, no, not not mild. Uh, totally cooked to get away the the gra uh, the gla uh, grassy uh, grassy odor. And uh, afterwards, for the tra for the transportation. Um, for the transportation, people compress it into the small cakes because the loosened ones are very uh, fragile and can will be bro bro uh, break back, break to pieces and vary in a very pleasant, unpleasant way. So China, ancient Chinese people in Tang Dynasty they press into the cake, but still the the, uh, the processing method using the steam to steam up the tea leaves is still is, is still being used in nowadays China in some Hubei and Zhejiang provinces. They do still have that. And also um, here from some of the questions, I hear there's a um, a little bit confusion about uh, what is the processing method of tea versus what is the drinking style of tea. So, so yeah. obviously, you know, for for this series, we're focusing on the drinking style of tea. So, uh, so that that's a big difference. So, making tea, so it's very important. Again, uh, I want to emphasize that why Tang Dynasty marks the start of tea culture, right? Um, uh, it, it's because that's the part where we start making the tea, right? So before you basically take tea as this plant, you just kind of eat it as it is. Like there was, we didn't put thought onto processing into something uh, that would transform this thing. So processing is basically like in today's um, uh, term, it will be like, did we make it into a green tea, a white tea, you know, a yellow tea, a oolong? So, so back in the days, people already start putting those kind of uh, thought process into the tea and then made a, a, a tea, right? Um, versus the brewing style, or the, or I shouldn't call it brewing, it's just the drinking style. So no matter if you're toasting the tea and baking the tea, it's not really, the tea is already stabilized. Like you're not actually, uh, making the tea you are uh preparing the tea for actually yeah, preparing the tea for the drinking exactly so basically you can consider if i were to use wine as an analogy it's almost like there's a big difference between uh eating grapes or having grape juice and it's like in Tang dynasty we finally start to 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 make wine instead of just drinking uh a some kind of primitive version of, of the <laughs> <laughs> like a you know wine must and things like that and then um and then uh the the baking the tea prior to prepare for 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 the grinding that'll be the equivalent of almost like a decanning a bottle or something like that so so that's the the difference I'm, i hope this analogy helps to uh clear out some of the the confusion a little bit 
All right, so um, where is the museum? Uh, we, we have a few questions about where is the museum for uh, the uh, mm -hmm. utensils that people use in town I see that has on Earth. Actually, I just uh, Googled that. Um, it seems like it's a uh, Does that sound right? Um, the, uh, those those museums, they have the cooperation together. So sometimes the, the sets will be displayed in the Historian Museum. Sometimes it will give, give them back to the Fanlun the Temple Museum. Um, there are cooperation. So maybe not, maybe recent years it was being stored inside the uh, Shanxi Historian Museum. But I've been visit, visiting there for several times a year for the past mm -hmm. three, three or two years, but I haven't seen them being displayed because they have a huge storage <laughs> for over 100, uh, over 1 million 70, uh, 700, 700,000 pieces of, of relics. So I don't really think they're, they're in the showing displaying now, but maybe some, someday later they will. Um, because those sets of tea utensils are very exquisite, so they definitely will, you know, display for some for some special event or some somehow. Last time I saw this uh, relics was in five years ago in Fanlun Temple Museum. By then, there, were, there was a very some some anniversary something about the Fanlun Temple uh, or somehow. Right. Yeah. So I'm um, typing it in. Um, uh, it's, it'll be the third under answered. Um, so it's basically the Famen Temple or the Shanxi History Temple. Depends on, um, I guess, you know, because we don't know the old who has the ownership of the set. Uh, it might be translated or transferred. Yeah. I know also sometimes it's it's on tour in either even other other provinces and cities in China. Um, all right. So it's the set for whisking ground tea. Um, for for the Tang Dynasty set, uh, it was not for whisking. You know, it was it was the boiling. No. Um, that was method. Oh, sure the, the, the the poaching method. So yeah, so it's still it looked like it was boiling. This is also the the intricacy about the tea making. You know, like even when uh, you in modern days, it might look like you're baking the tea or you're roasting the tea, but it's actually two different things. Even though it, it might appear the same. Uh, mostly because the, the temperature and the time you're controlling um, uh, around the tea is very different. So, so it's not just about the vessel, it's also about what are you actually doing to the tea leaves. So it might look like you're boiling the tea, but you're like poaching the tea, you know, very gently yeah. boil the tea. Um, is the Green Tang Dynasty Longquan uh, glaze? Oh. Um, yeah. Well, actually, uh -huh. yeah, the, the time is a little off, right? It's confusing a little bit because Longquan Yao as Longquan Glaze has been no very for or been famous in recent uh not recent years, not in Qing and Ming Qing dynasty much yeah. much more famous. Because during that era, during Tang Dynasty era, the most famous uh southern uh southern green glaze processing center is the Yue Yao. Yue is actually a, a short name for Zhejiang province, including part of Jiangsu province in China and now um, territory. So the, uh, the, there's a confusion about this. Even for Chinese people, it's very confusing that Longquan and the Yue Yao and other uh, Ge Yao and a lot of things. But mostly the three of them also locate in the very narrow geographic uh, 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 era area, like in Zhejiang province. Uh, maybe they're quite similar, quite closely together, but Longquan glaze is totally different from the Yue Yao glaze. Uh, according to the relics we dig up from the earth, from the tombs or other uh, other sites, uh, the Yue Yao glazed uh, tea ball is, can be sh is showing a little uh, yellowish green. Actually, it's yellowish green. Uh, some some was named like Mi Se, so the secret uh, re a secret ingredient proseling or somehow secret glaze. Uh, the, because the recipe is secret, uh, was known. So uh, Yue Yao relics uh, we now know, uh, we, can, we have now found is almost uh, the, like the, the yellowish green. And Longquan glaze, now we can see, especially the modern manufacturing ones, they're almost very uh, bluish green, even bluish green or pure green, grassy green uh, glaze. So there, I think there are differences between those two. And Longquan was 
firstly, uh, originally famous for the sword making instead of the yes. uh, yeah. making <laughs> in Tang Dynasty. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say, you know, if you ever uh, visit Longquan, so so the so the this is a very um, uh, good question okay. because. So, you know, for those uh, wonder why uh, this is asked, because Longquan uh, current day is um, the basically the um, very well known for their green porcelain. So um, uh, it's a great question, but it's just the timing is a little off. So when Longquan is famous for their green um, uh, porcelain is in a much closer time to now than um, it was in Tang Dynasty, uh, where it was mostly Zhejiang. And then the... Uh, but Longquan, if you ever go there for the green porcelain, if that's uh, the style of porcelain you like, just know it's also the sort capital of China. And uh, I had an opportunity to see some amazing, amazing sword. And people literally beat a, a iron ore uh, into steel. Yeah, and then like, you know, like all this legendary thing about how a sword looks so dull from far away and then uh, but when you look up close or get the light and you shake it, all of a sudden you see this ribble. And you're, oh, it's so amazing. It's so cool. I know. It's like a feather. But 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 the ones that look immediately with like the lines and everything, they were actually oh. the, the real ones. <laughs> yeah. All right. So next question. From what I understand, most water has salt in some level of mineralization. Was any salt to actually give the drink a slightly salt taste or an effort to mineralize the water? Actually, um, I don't think so, mostly because <laughs> The, the 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 rationale behind it because remember this was a period where we're 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 uh we're we're simple simplifying the process so it's different from like nowadays when people are consciously try to improve their water because they already taken tea as something you're supposed to drink with water and nothing else and you might add a little salt to improve the water but this was back in the days when uh you know where you basically tea was a thick soup and you're trying to 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 simplify that so, so salt yeah. was the last component that hasn't been let go yet so the rationale behind it um for me wouldn't seem to to be the right rationale what do you think um i, I tried to uh i tried to to make myself some uh, salted green uh, steamed green tea with uh with the tea powder made uh, made recent years um and it definitely improved the flavor of course the flavor, uh, but only with a touch of the salt. So that is why in our video clip, the, the video clips, uh, the, the tea maker, they show they have to try the, have to taste the water before you put or, or you add the tea powder inside it. Because that is when you know the flavor is okay. And I tried and I have to say with only a hint of the salt, with the only a pinch of the salt, it really improved the, 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 the flavor because the, for the, uh, steamed green tea powders, um, just despite of the, 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 uh, the powder or the, you know, very unpleasant chewy feelings, but still the, the taste for the tea infusion itself is very bitter and astring stringent. And a little pinch of salt can actually uh, improve it with a very uh, refreshing flavor and uh, only, a, a uh, only a, uh, just a pinch of salt is, is okay. It's good. <laughs> so I don't really think that pinch of still can change the can actually uh, the, as uh, I forgot the word uh, mineralize mineralize it will, will not change the mineral inside the water actually. All yeah. right. Um, Damn, sodium. Uh, the reason that the entire used the cup holder was that because the bowl was hot from preheating and the tea. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So the holder was to prevent. Um, uh, the drinker from burning themselves. Any suggested reading about ancient style tea drinking like classic tea or da guan cha lun you mentioned? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there are actually a, a whole bunch of tea books. I mean, if you're impressed <laughs> with the, the tea books from Tao and Song Dynasty, you'll be you'll be in for a treat in Ming Dynasty, right? Because that's like really the explosion of, uh, of tea yeah. books. Um, actually, there are a lot of uh, research papers that um, uh, but it's all in Chinese. The so people actually have yeah. done a lot of very detailed research on these ancient tea books. So, so yeah. But I, I'm actually no idea. I don't. I'm not sure if any 
uh, English scholar have done? Um, Not much. Um, but I, I think I have something. Uh, wait a second. I'm um, sorry. Yeah, maybe we can we can uh, get you know some. Of the give out, give out, give you guys all some new afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And then, does, does the Japanese tea of brewing matcha similar to the demonstration of, in the video, whereas the water is added in stages and whisked to create the thick foam? Um, from similar. what I have observed, yeah, I mean, I'm not an expert in Chinese uh, in Japanese tea drinking. I've only attended a tea ceremony where other people made tea for me. Um, I don't think it was it was it was definitely not seven stages, you know. Uh, mm. Actually, from what I've seen, it was just one stage, uh, maybe two stages maximum. Maybe I have missed something, but definitely not seven stages. Because, um, and also, I feel like the, the the motion of the whisking is also a little bit different. Um, I know that the repeated whisking is trying to maximize the foam. Um, from what I have seen in Japanese tea ceremony, uh, it was not whisked that many times, but still I was able to enjoy very creamy foam. Maybe there was like some improvement on the technique of the whisking. Um, yeah. So what do you, what do you think? Well, uh, I, I used to attend some Japanese ceremony, very uh, solemn way of uh, ceremony. I do believe that there are lots of spiritual experiences during the Japanese ceremony rather than um, Chinese ways. I'm not trying to demise my own culture is because uh, for tea drinking in Song Dynasty in Dian Cha style, people are focusing, focusing on the tea itself rather than the, the, the gestures or the, the, the environments. They're more focusing right. on the tea soups and the, the one of the greatest feature of tea soup of Dian Cha is like the foam. So they have to, to, to they adopt the uh, seven stages of uh, water adding or something and also whisking uh, gesture for only to make more foam than the Japanese style. And for the Japanese style uh, tea ceremony, there are two types of tea that will serve you for the most solemn way, so solemn way of tea ceremony. One is nong cha, it's called, I don't know how to say it in, in Japanese original. Um, yeah, nong cha is like the, with a small amount of water and a big bowl and you have to share the drink with people. Like it's called lunyi, like drinking in turns uh, from the from the master to the uh, to the main main guest and to the minor to to other guests and sharing all ball all ball of tea and this way of drinking that, that requires the tea to be very thick, very thick and uh, with only just a, a whisk to make the tea powder uh, to spread it and evenly. And the foam is just not the fe main major feature for their aesthetic uh, for tea drinking. And the second type of tea drinking in Japanese ceremony I experienced is dian bo cha. So uh, in that in that style, the people drinking tea with only a very uh, a comparatively uh, uh, how to say this. Um, uh, milder tea with not not that concentrated yeah, tea, like a little bit yeah. more watery. Yeah. yeah, more water, so make you feel a lot a lot better to taste, a lot better to taste. So I think the different uh, major different difference between the Japanese uh, Japanese tea ceremony or cha dao uh, quest uh, from the Chinese different tea style tea ceremony is that we focus on different things. Um, maybe Japanese styles were more focusing on the whole ceremony itself, and for Chinese people, were mostly concerned about drinking the tea itself <laughs> rather than the other, uh, yeah, environments or something. Yeah, yeah, you already see like the uh, the difference of focus um, in Song Dynasty. You know, some people might argue uh, that today, obviously, you know, the what Chinese uh, value in the tea drinking experience is different from uh, a Japanese experience. However, uh, so one might argue it's because, you know, the, it's matcha versus uh, it's loosely tea. However, um, even in Song Dynasty, where it's kind of arguably both are matcha, but you'll see the Chinese, even though we started this whole thing, but we didn't have a tea ceremony. We're just like not you know, not not in general, very ceremonial uh, oriented people. I was mm -hmm. I would say you can observe this kind of uh, like 
like laid back approach to things uh, for a lot of Chinese uh, cultural elements. So tea is definitely one of them. The focus is very much on, around tea and that tradition has been carried till today. So today, you know, for a Chinese person is still, I mean, obviously aesthetics is important, but what's more important, uh, the most important thing is always the tea itself. How does it actually taste and what has caused the tea to taste a certain way? These are so much more important things uh, than, you know, how, 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 how fancy one actually did uh, the tea. And then the next question, when did they start firing tea with charcoal smoke? Was it done for flavor or to preserve it? Um, I think this one needs a little bit of clarification. So we didn't use charcoal smoke. And this question actually came up when we um, did the virtual tea trip to Lishan as well, when uh, a lot of folks saw that charcoal was used as a tea source. Keep in mind, these are very, very high quality charcoal. They actually do not create smoke. The reason people use charcoal instead of what log is actually because it does not have smoke. Uh, smoke is a big no-no for Chinese tea drinking, unless it's this one um, deliberately smoked tea, uh, which is a Zheng Chan Xiaodong or Lapsen Xuchong. Other than that one, smoky, smoke note in tea is a, is, a, is a big fault. You do not want that to, to happen. So it was not, yeah, so, so when we're not doing the, the smoke, charcoal was just a heat source. <laughs> Uh, oh, so this person um, was trying to clarify um, that was bar butter only added to tea after um, the Mongols had arrived Song Dynasty. I think this is like different, like this is the <laughs> animal that comes from, right? Like there, um, so there's like the, the butter, you know, obviously yuck butter, because yuck, I mean, only is live on highlands. So, you know, if you go to like southern China, you're not going to find the, that particular animal. But uh, water buffalo is a very common uh, agriculture uh, kind of assistant in Chinese throughout China, you know, if you have rice field and things like that. So that's why I was saying um, uh, dairy from a water buffalo is probably more likely. And that certainly did not come from the, the Mongols because, um, well, for, you know, they have horses, but they don't have water buffaloes. <laughs> they, don't have, they, don't, they don't have the rice field to, to, to farm. <laughs> Right, right, right. So yeah, so it's kind of like a, yeah, so it's still, you know, a, basically kind of a, um, a dairy fat. That's yeah. probably that. Um, with Dian Chai style, was the first boil separated cold and added later for the second boil? Um, I think it's added yeah. later the second boil because the water temperature have to reach a certain uh, certain degree, certain like uh, I don't know how to try, how how to um, uh, how to say this in Fahrenheit, but I do. Uh, it's, it's about the ninety Celsius degree. That is quite close to the in a normal atmosphere and uh, uh, to the second boil with the with a crab eye shaped like uh, the bubbles around uh, around the edge of the water to the to the kettle. So. It, 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 it used to be described as the hardest thing to do in the Jiancha style is to just to, de uh, to detect oh, in, in okay. also the Jiancha style and the Jiancha, Jiancha style because Jiancha style is in the it was boiled in the pot like fu, a pot a big pot so it's not very hard for people to observe the water condition and to detect it um, with um, listening to the sound or the watch or observing from the uh, for the for the look, for our look. but the for the appearance, but the Dian Cha style, they use the, tea, the, the kettle, a uh, very uh, not see-through kettle, a uh, uh, ceramic kettle, uh, we call Tang Ping, with the long spout, so, long spout. so it, has, it cannot be very hard to detect only by listening to the sound and also to watch the, the steam that goes out from the long spout. So uh, it still, it still will use the second, uh, second, second boil of water. Still, Chinese people are kind of like against to the third bottle was because we believe yeah, that um, oh, but yeah, yeah. not very fresh anymore. Uh, you know, for Jian Cha, you do keep some um, at the early boil uh, of the the, the, yeah. the last half to add it to the to the to the bowl to to basically stop the boiling and and then you know you can have the tea. 
Um, so the next question, is there a recent renewed interest or a renaissance of the Song Dynasty tea traditions? I've seen more of Song Dynasty tea featured recently on Chinese social media, uh, such as, I guess it's Zhang Zifeng uh, doing Cha Bai Xi. How much do we know about the way tea was produced and prepared in the Song Dynasty? Or are the modern recreations reconstructed to some extent from Japanese tea traditions? Um, like what we saw in the video clip, the, the, character, the character that was written on, on the side of the screen, it was directly, um, was di directly uh, say, copied, uh, noted, or, or uh, from, certain, cited from the Da Guan Cha Lun. So we, have, we do have the uh, literature, or the, uh, the, the, the records. But of course, we don't have the, the images, or oh, we have the images, we have the paintings but we don't have the videos to take everything up by then. So of course, I think the most of the tea uh, artists nowadays in, in China, they borrow or they uh, was inspired from the Japanese tea uh, Dian Cha style, uh, especially with the way they using the whisk and combine the, their gestures with the ancient records, with the ancient documents and, and, and the writings of the tea artists during Song Dynasty. And for the Renaissance, for the tea, Song Dynasty uh, aesthetic, I think there are some, um, how to say, there are some promotion behind this uh, for the, including, uh, including for the, the, the compliments for the Song Dynasty's achievements, especially about the aesthetic and the literature, the, the calligraphy, the writings and everything. Um, especially uh, because there is a saying, there used to be a saying in Chinese history uh, about the Chinese historians. Uh, they said the town was thought, a town, a town Han dynasties, they were thought as powerful and strong, but the real rich ones are actually the Song yeah. dynasty because that's the only dynasty the Chinese people encourage people to doing the business, like the, the commercial business. There, there, there are royal families who uh, the, the, the country actually lost a lot of grassland. They have to make the, uh, make the trade with the northern border, with, with other countries in the northern borders and the western borders. So this is the only time of the period that Chinese history, in Chinese history of the society actually likes about the commercial uh, business to doing. So that, I think, um, it's quite a little bit related to the nowadays in Chinese society that people are encouraging the, all the com commercial business and uh, giving out uh, lots of credits to the uh, social improvements or somehow to about to related to the uh, market free marketing for, for the for the commercial uh, business uh, booming is also I think of course there are a lot of re recreation but for most of Chinese scholars they like to stick to to the records but they have to borrow something from other uh, culture forms uh, somehow, like with our own imagination <laughs> about the, the, how the people live their life. And uh, I don't really think there will, will, we will get a very objective way of the presentation for the history because we cannot. We have to make, uh, have to give up some, give, uh, giving our some, some of our imagination about it to make it more vivid and more understandable, understandable for, for normal people, for everyone else. Yeah, so and also this, um, this aspect also has to be seen uh, not as, you know, uh, basically uh, so distinguished that it's, it cannot, um, we have to consider basically the greater context of uh, how this came to be, and there are uh, other trends that kind of just uh, um, push this forward. And one of them is, um, so first of all, there's definitely observation bias, right? So uh, it's kind of what you immerse yourself in. So for, for tea people, you know, if you're keep looking for interesting things to do with tea, new things to do with tea, and yeah. there are a lot of uh, people in the tea world, uh, definitely, you know, have a great interest in going back into some of the older traditions and either, either for fun, for personal interest or for, you know, wanting to share with others or maybe uh, even to take it for some commercial interest that to, to recreate some of the traditions. So that's, that's one thing. And it's no, in no way like a, a broad uh, influence on the, great, on the general population 
in China. But also keep in mind, this is also the time where uh, there are TV shows, right? There are drama shows. And um, you definitely, definitely see that whenever there is a uh, blockbuster uh, drama show for any particular period, and all of a sudden, you know, uh, you see people taking a great interest in traditions of that period. Uh, so for example, I don't know if it was one or two years ago, there was this drama show called Zhifo Zhifo, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and it was, uh, it, the, the setting was in Song Dynasty. So that actually caused a great um, uh, interest in the Song style, everything, right? Because, you know, to, yeah. it's fascinating of all the details in the drama and all that. So, so, so that'll oh. be kind of almost like a fashion uh the the same the same crew uh, the same crew that made Drifo Drifo I mean the producing crew they also made a very famous uh, Song style aesthetic uh, drama show called Qing Ping Yue which is more oh. close which is closer a lot closer to the real history uh, rather than the the Drifo Drifo because Drifo is more like about what 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 was innovative uh, created based on novel um, yeah it's novel but Qing Ping Yue is almost like history yeah okay. and then. Um, another thing is also, um, you know, just like here in the um, U.S., you know, if you ever uh, wanted to renovate your home or, or decorate your space, uh, you have to go with some, some style, right? They like a yeah. modern style, a classic style, and the Victorian, whatever. So in China, it's the same. It's, so it's just our reference is a little bit different. So people will be like, oh, I really like the aesthetic of Qing style. I really like the aesthetic of Ming style, of Song style, of Tang style, and all that. So yeah, so, so basically it's that wave as well. And that's always there. I wouldn't just call yeah. it a renaissance. It's just now people are more um, aesthetically aware and more uh, economically uh, capable to to call on a style. It's like I want my home to be like that. Um, <laughs> yeah. So so it's like these kind of things. Um, yeah. And then next to do a mock replica of the ground up Song Dynasty style brewery with using a good producer source and Shiyu green tea be anything similar to what it was back then? Like the best recreation of uh, like a Stone Dynasty. Um, um, I think not actually, <laughs> I think not. Um, there's a, a crucial difference between the stone density tea product they use uh, is from the Fujian province and according to Da Guan Cha Lun, the tea classic of, uh, written by Song Huizong, and he mentioned that the tea have to, be, the tea material, the fresh tea leaves will be steamed and squeezed and then washed and repeated, repeated, repeatedly for three times to get rid of the over strong taste of the Fujian province tea. And En Shi Yulu, they're using the totally different sub-variety or the cultivar from the uh, Fujian, Fujian province tea trees. So the taste will be a lot different. And according to the ancient documents, they said that to make the foam whiter and they have to wash the tea material, to, to wash the tea um, have materials for uh, several times, like three times in a row, and also adding up some other ingredients, including long xian xiang, which I don't know how to say in English, is another. Um, uh, it's, 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 it's a little bothered. Yeah. <laughs> oh. it's, 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 it's a totally different subject. Basically, the all the quirky ways of how Chinese obtain our um, incense. Um, yeah. And, and, and um, Perfume. And also, um, I, I do believe if you try, if someone try use the En Shi Yulu to use as a, a recreation for or, or to, to try um, to to practice the Song Dian Cha Dynasty, it can be close close to the normal product by then. Maybe not the royal family product, but the normal product. Uh, it's quite, it can be similar because uh, based on what the, the government uh, required for the uh, glow, uh, for the national tea producing back to Song Dynasty, it was uh, controlled and uh, uh, managed by the government, all, all by the government. So that's when, and also that's a time when the tea smuggling is very serious crime by then. So every corner of the country actually adopting the same 
uh, processing uh, processing um, yeah, the same tea product processing flow uh, similar to the to the to the tea, steam tea cakes. It's just no, maybe not that much of the the pressed models with the beautiful royal uh, royal family symbols. But still, uh, the steam the uh, steam uh, green tea will have will have the same uh, common feature as the grassy odor. They all have not compared to the uh, Longjing Dragon Wild tea. Uh, in the Ming Dynasty, they will still have. So you can probably get the closest taste, but still not exact same. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, but uh, with that said, though, um, Enshi Yulu remains the uh, most well known current day Chinese steamed green tea, as we by and large have abandoned this method <laughs> of uh, processing the tea. Uh, now, most Chinese teas are either pan fried or uh, baked. So, so, so if you want to try like a Chinese style steamed green, which can be compared to a Japanese style uh, steamed green, and Shiru will still be the best to go. Uh, the pot with the gooseneck Indian cha style, how did they keep the water hot? Um, they, I don't think so they, they, yeah. <laughs> they, they heat the cup. Yeah. And also like, remember the water is not boiling anyway. So there's a little bit leeway um, of that as well. And we also have a lot of, uh, in uh, common. So um, let me go through that really quickly and then to see. Um, uh, so, uh, but I think it was asked at a different time. So the uh, so that it's a, it's a different dynasty, right? I think that when you, this person asked the question it was about Han Dynasty, which we already know is a Han Jing Di uh, tomb and the Famansu was in uh, Tang Dynasty, which is different, right? Um, yeah, with green onions with tea, probably tea uh, back then was bitter and grassy, so onions and ginger would be a good uh, companion, could be. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the, uh, yes, but so, uh, so here's another uh, thing about clarifying the uh, concept, so people talk about how um, uh, the people use ripe puller with orange peel now, but keep in mind, but ripe puller has a very short history. It was only around since the 70s. So, so it's, it's, a, yeah. it's, not, um, it's not parallel. So they're not really in one system. Um, probably the tea bag was very, mm -hmm. okay. Um, yes, it definitely makes a great, uh, veggie stock. Citrus acid neutralized uh, astringency. Yes. Um, it was, uh, yes, it could be used for digestion as well. And uh, let me also see the next one. Sorry, I'm just, I, I just wanted to go through this before uh, we wrap it up. And to, cause it's, uh, sometimes it's, you know, just nice comments. And I um, didn't want to confuse that with the questions, uh, the relic name. So the museum, I already put that into the, uh, name. So was salt a um, uh, 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 betrothal uh, gift? So is yan before marriage? Yes, there is. Some reason in some regions, yes, they do. Yeah, um, so in the yeah, southwest yeah. part of China, they do, mm -hmm. and also tea. <laughs> yes, yes, it'll be wonderful if we can have a, a demonstration with the golden tea set. I think it was done once. Yeah, uh, the internet but it's not common now because it i mean it's you know national treasure um <laughs> it's just can't, it cannot go on tour <laughs> right uh, mm -hmm. so the olive charcoal do you mean the pits or the whole fruit and how would that impart flavor um uh from what i know yes for the olive charcoal it was basically the pit of the olive right okay. and then you have to burn it so carefully that you actually keep the integrity of the shape um, no, it's not supposed to impart uh, flavor. This is a whole different connoisseurship about charcoal in China. Um, and basically it impacts how the water will turn out. So it's not about flavor, it was more about the texture of the water and all those, um, which nowadays people still argue, you know, like you, I've heard- It's very, it's very arguable and it's very, uh, it's kind of like, confusing for most of even Chinese people to to learn about this because the charcoal and um, according to some ancient Chinese medical um, books 
the different charcoal for boiling the the matter the, the herbs uh, herbs juice it will uh, it will it will affect the character of the juice itself it was uh, it was believed that the, the olive charcoal was uh, was pro wooden element or somehow <laughs> yes. it's, <definitely laughs> it's very confusing uh, yeah but, it's very kind um, of um, realm yeah yeah and, and and also and also I was told by the uh, the Fujian province friends they told me about that they the reason they use the olive charcoal is because the olive uh, the the core of olive fruit is very um, strong texture and very um, intense texture uh, the texture is very intense so if you charcoal those two the the the, the charcoal you charcoal those and the charcoal the uh, made from the olive uh, cores can produce more heat. Than ordinary wooden charcoals, so that probably will make the water just you know boiling faster <laughs> than it should be even the normal wooden charcoal. So it's believed it's better to use the olive charcoal yes, because nowadays we all with electricity. <laughs> yeah, and there are also like other fancy charcoals like a longwen charcoal, uh, lychee charcoal. I mean. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That there's like a whole uh, charcoal connoisseurship in China and then they'll have heated conversation about uh, how the different charcoals had impacted their water and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, which <laughs> it's, it's definitely it's a, a, a... superstitious. Yeah. <laughs> and... Maybe it's not uh, really. <laughs> I know. Yeah, so the uh, next question uh, was what kind of tea were made into powder during this period? Was it mostly green tea or were there other teas powdered as well? Almost green tea. Yeah. Okay. And then, so, here, so basically green tea dominated tea history mm -hmm. in China. Uh, we basically I haven't moved on to other teas yet. So, so, so for all we talk about right now, it's all green tea. Uh, and you'll see, you know, later that we we kind of uh, transition. Next, in next episode, we'll take we'll talk about the other tea appearances and uh, origins in Chinese history after the Ming, the end of the Ming Dynasty. Right. Yeah, next episode or episode after that. Okay. Yep. Um, Okay, somebody was asking about the green tea being roasted, but I think I already addressed that about the, the difference between uh, preparing the tea for uh, drinking versus the, the actual processing of the tea. Um, Before uh, yeah, so it, not, it was not a uh, seno uh, This is important. The seno no. never came to China. This is not so just a uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, no, he's not. <laughs> no, it's a very, yeah, it's an instrumental figure in Japanese tea ceremony. Uh, however, uh, first of all, it, it was not the same time period, and also uh, he, uh, he, he's not the same, not the same monk, basically. Yeah, he's not the same monk. Uh, but he's a very uh, important monk in uh, Japanese tea history. The the real monk who took uh who took the tea back to Japan in the mid mid, mid South Song era is the Rongxi Chanshi and his Japanese pronunciation uh, is let me see uh yeah, hold on. I can't read Japanese <laughs> um that was. Rongxi Chanshu brought back to brought tea back to his to Japan almost 150 years before Zenolikyo's birth. Mm -hmm. So he's way, way much earlier than Zenolikyo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, so basically when Zenolikyo uh, was um, uh, developing the tea ceremony, it, you know, obviously tea drink tea and tea drinking was already introduced. So yeah, so he was developing upon that it was not the person who actually brought tea. Yeah. Um, mm, I forgot. <laughs> I cannot remember. Cannot recall right. the name. So, of it. Yeah, so I'm gonna just keep going through the um, comments to make sure we didn't miss anything. There were a lot of uh, um, uh, people saying hi and then say thank you. Uh, when Tian so, uh, people expressing <laughs> their appreciation. Um, and 
cool. Yes, the Chinese olive is different from the um, uh, Japanese, uh, sorry, from the European olive, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Okay, so I think we have covered all the uh, questions and uh, comments now, or maybe there was, a, was there another question on this? I feel like the number has changed. Uh, technically, when do we see transition from medicine, uh, druggist mortar to another tool to grind tea into powder? Uh, I'm not sure if we know the exact answer. Um, yeah. It's a very interesting. I mean, somebody could write a research paper on this. Um, but do we know? Like, when do they move from the this kind of uh, uh, grind to the, <laughs> to the male grind? Like, the more the exact time? Exact time? Um, uh, yeah, kind of like the transition from the from one equipment to uh, to the other. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, Cha Mo, the tea mill was adopted by the mid. Uh, yeah, tea mill. Tea mill was the, this this uh, this piece of ab, uh, equipment was only was only uh, appear make appearance in the tea painting. In the Nan Song, in the, in the South Song era, which is about the end of in, end of twelfth century, end of twelfth century. I think the second part of Song Dynasty. So Song Dynasty, Song Dynasty after yeah. the the northern invasion of Jin Kingdom. Yeah. Um. But the yeah, I think this will be a, a great uh topic almost for someone yeah. you know. Wants to try, I would you know, encourage my students to write. It's a, about it. Right, right. <laughs> that and find out, uh, or if there's an incident or something that has uh, facilitated this kind of change, things like that. Yeah, my mm -hmm. thing for now, yeah. it's uh, we only understand that, that it has transitioned, but we kind of don't know the the process of that in a way. <laughs> yeah, this is, there's there are too much to learn about tea, so. I was I always consider myself as only a little apprentice about it for inside the tea tea learnings. I can I, I would never call myself as a tea master. I would not. I'm always being I would like to stay being a student. There's too much things to know. There are too much things that still need to be certified or to be proved with other evidence of archaeologists or other, you know, the, the, um, some sort of other researching. Too many of them. <laughs> Yeah, well, somebody um, uh, among the audience has helped us to uh, uh, answer a question about the uh, Rongxi uh, Chen Shi okay. English. So, uh, yeah, so, so there it is. I have uh, copy pasted that answer. I, I don't, I haven't verified that, but um, should be right. If I'm pretty sure if you plug that into uh, in, uh, um, uh, Wikipedia, it'll uh, give you an answer. Okay. This has a lot to do with basically. Uh, Chinese were so used to pronouncing Japanese names, uh, which is written in Chinese characters in the Chinese way. So, so in a lot of ways, like a Chinese person would know how to write uh, famous Japanese people's names and book titles. <laughs> the pronunciation is actually completely different. Where I mean, the people honor the, uh, the the actual Japanese pronunciation. It's almost like we go more with the writing instead of the pronunciation. So there's always like this second thought process that, that has to then so okay but how was you know um is pronounced yeah. all right thank you so much everyone um, so, um i'm gonna post this um again on youtube and uh we'll see if we're able to uh share other resources which will all be announced um on t drunk's instagram so you can follow us on instagram at t drunk um and then you'll see once we have more detail but the video will be on um youtube i mean i'm not very experienced in that so i don't know if we're gonna face any technical difficulties but that's the plan and thank you again Wen Tian, so much you're welcome yeah, sorry we have taken so much of your time. Uh, and thank you everyone for uh, joining us today and stay with us for this late. Now yeah. we are going to see you again in uh, a week's time. So yeah. next Sunday at 8 p.m. We're going to talk at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which is 8 a.m. your time. Um, for uh, the 
you know, how people actually drink tea in Ming and Qing dynasty, which is uh, closer to what we see nowadays. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Thank you, guys. See you next week. All right. Thank you. Bye.